Hey guys, Filthy Robot here, bringing the guides, tips, and tricks video. This time we're talking about Battle Brothers perks, and I know a number of you have been waiting for uh, this guide, and I've been waiting to make it. I wanted to lay some basic background first before releasing this guide, uh, but I'm really excited to talk about the Battle Brothers perks. Uh, for me, this was one of the most fun parts of the game, was exploring and experimenting with different perks and builds, so I'm really, really looking forward to talking about this. Okay, um, a couple things I want to say first. Um, a, it's going to take me uh, more than one video to talk about the perks. There's a number of perks in this game. I'm hoping to get through it in two videos, but it might take three. So I will break this up at some point uh, based probably on time uh, for this. So that's the first thing. Second, um, I will be doing a build guide later where I talk about the actual builds I used and basically how the perks can go together into various character builds. So this guide, when we talk about these perks, is going to be tr uh, talking about the perks, but not putting them into guides yet. We'll talk about into into character builds yet. Uh, we'll talk about that in another video. And then finally, I'm gonna give each of these perks a strength rating, but the strength rating should be interpreted like this. In a build that uses this perk, how strong, how influential, how important to that build is that perk? In other words, in a, in a build that uses fast adaptation, how strong is fast adaptation compared to other skills in that build? So it's a bit of a bit of a weird rating system because I don't think there's another way to do it really. Because for example, take a skill like Rally. Rally is both very, very strong, but also very, very specific to only a couple builds. This isn't a skill you're gonna wanna use on many builds, but it's gonna be a skill that is extremely important on the builds you do use it. So I feel like the, the perk strength has to kind of be uh, reflective relative to other perks you would take on that build. So it's going to make it a little bit weird when we talk about it. Bear with me. These are all kind of arbitrary ratings. These are my personal ratings, but I'm hoping to give some justifications for why I've come up with that. Okay, so let's start. So uh, we start with the, the perks that you can get at level two. The way the perk system in Battle Brothers works is as your character's level, uh, they get a perk. You're going to get a total of 10 perk points across the course of your character's life. Your first one at level two, your 10th one at level 11. Um, and uh, you can have any perk uh, that... At level two, you get access to these ones. You have to have one perk point in the previous level before you can go to the next level. But what that does mean is since there's only three, there's only seven levels, which means that you're gonna have a number of perk points afterwards. You can have multiples on some levels, basically. So let's get started. Fast adaptation. Um, I do think some builds benefit from fast adaptation, particularly in the early game, particularly throwaway builds, builds on characters that you're not expecting to survive the entire course of your campaign. What it does is give you um, Every time you miss an attack, you get plus eight accuracy stacking for your next attack uh, until you hit something. Once you hit something, you lose all your accuracy bonuses. This is quite good on very, very low accuracy characters because it means they're gonna their overall hit percentage is going to be increased by quite a bit because they're missing a very large number of their attacks as a percentage, which means you're often getting plus hit percentage stuff. Um, however, as you uh, accumulate uh, good characters and more powerful backgrounds of course, across the course of the game, your characters are going to get inherently more accurate, which means that the uh, likelihood of fast adaptation triggering happens less and uh, isn't going to be quite as useful. What I find that means is great in the early game, and there's a couple classes where it's kind of useful for across the course of the game. Um, I find this useful on classes that stun, uh, I do build some stunners in some of my campaigns, which I use to control very high priority targets like um, sergeants or zweihanders or two-handed uh, uh, hedge knights or something like that. These guys who do a ton of damage if, they, if I don't kill them and either often are hard to kill or sometimes I don't want to kill them because I want to farm their armor, which means I need to keep them alive for a number of rounds. Um, in that scenario, I want to stun them. In that scenario, fast adaptation is very, very useful for me because I need those stuns to hit so they don't do a ton of damage to me and accuracy becomes at a premium uh, much more so than another build. Um, I also like this on archers. I don't always manage to fit it into my archer build. Some seasons I seem to use it, some seasons I don't. I like it in archers, um, particularly when fighting goblins. Your archers eventually will get pretty much accurate enough for everything else, but you never can really be accurate enough for goblins. Goblins have anticipation, which makes them very, very difficult to shoot with ranged weapons, especially from a very far distance, which is how you want to fight goblins, uh, and it's useful there. Um, that said, I don't always use it. It's a difficult one to fit in, uh, and with archers in particular, there is a negative, quite a big downside of fast adaptation, which is if your uh, your archer bullet scatters, uh, it will you and then the scatter hits something, it does use up your fast adaptation stack, 
So it kind of sucks that uh, that kind of hit counts against your fast adaptation. But uh, overall, I think this is, as I said, about a power level three, three out of five. So I guess I should have said the scale to begin with. One is the strongest, two is the next strongest, three is the next strongest, four is the next strongest, and five is the weakest. So um, this is about middle of the road in my in my set. Even for the builds that want to build it, it's about a middle of the road uh, ability. It's not going to help all of the time, but it will help some of the time, and it's useful when it does. Uh, crippling strikes i would give this a five my lowest power rating out there i don't take this on anybody anymore and i started out by taking this on almost everybody and it basically is because what the perk says it does and how it actually interacts in the game are very very different not because the language is wrong just because of the scenarios that arise uh, crippling strikes what it does is it lowers the amount of damage you need to deal to cause a wound on an opponent to cause a, a status effect change on an opponent um so in this game, when your guys take damage, they have a chance based on the amount of damage they took compared to their full health, to compared to their total health, to take a wound. The wound uh, is a for your characters. It's a persistent but not permanent wound, so it will last for a number of days until cured. Uh, but in the but it has a negative status effect associated with it. If you take a wounded hand, you're going to have uh, accuracy penalties, for example, or something like this. Um, the reason why this isn't that great is that. The wounds are pretty random. They are tied to the weapon type you use, so the different types of weapons do different types of wounds. But in general, the status effect you put on your opponent is uh, out of your control. It's not like I could, if I could choose, guarantee that when I wound my opponent, I caused a minus accuracy from them or a minus defense modifier from them, it might be worth going. But because it's random and some of them are very helpful to you and some of them aren't, and it's very situational when they're helpful, a lot of times the wound has no impact on the course of the play anyways. Additionally, there's a lot of enemies that are basically immune to this. All undead can't have wounds, so it does nothing versus undead. Goblins have low enough HP that causing a wound to them rarely has any sort of impact because the next hit will kill them with or without that wound already, or oftentimes you'll one-shot them anyways. Um, there's basically a number of enemies where this has very little impact on the fight. Uh, there is an ability that takes advantage of wounded targets. Executioner does additional damage to wounded targets, and it feels like there should be some synergy between Crippling Strikes and Executioner. But what I have again found is the enemies that collect wounds rarely are the ones where this is going to be a meaningful modifier, and I just don't find it useful. I've uh, played this on my range characters, on my archers, on my crossbows, on my hybrids, on my pikemen, and what I've just found is it almost has no impact at all whatsoever on the on uh, the utility of these characters. I, I don't recommend this ability at all. Um, having tested it extensively, I just don't like it. I don't feel like it does anything most of the time that helps me. Um, I guess in part this is also due to the way that wounds work. Wounds on your characters are very impactful because your characters survive multiple fights and you have to, part of the, the game is managing wounds so that your wounded characters are, you sometimes have to fight with wounded characters because you need them, but the, the wound is potentially going to get them killed. Enemy characters only ever last one fight when you kill them. So wounding them is less important from a long-term thing than, than avoiding wounds yourself. All right, next up is Colossus. I give this a power rating of two. Um, as in the second best power rating. Um, what I find on my characters as a whole is that I almost always end up taking Colossus or Gifted uh, on my characters, uh, unless the characters are just absolutely incredible, like late game meme knights or, uh, excuse me, uh, hedge knights or uh, uh, cell swords or something like that, that a lot of times uh, what I find is because I want to raise... Uh, primarily my attack skill, my defense skill, and often a mix of resolve and fatigue, most of the times I don't have enough stat points available to raise health. And that a character might have um, very, very good attack and defense skills and um, for very, very good attack and defense stars and maybe fatigue stars, which means I want to keep leveling those to get a lot of value out of it, but I want to reach some minimum amount of resolve or health, and I can't do that without getting some help in the stat department. In other words, the the, the bar that I set for, my, uh, for the values of health, uh, fatigue, and resolve that I want on my characters isn't always reached without being forced to take either Colossus or Gifted. So I like Colossus for that. Colossus is also very good in the early game. Uh, in the very early game, your armor is very weak, which means a lot of the damage is going against your health, which means you will also take a bunch of injuries and often die. So having a big health increase is very important. Um, it will, or rather, it has a lot of valuable payoff there, and it will keep characters from dying in the early game and get them into the mid and uh, late game, which is kind of nice. Um, it's not that I want to take Colossus on most of my characters, 
But what I find is the impact it has on that character build is very, very strong because it gives me a ton of stats to apply, a ton of stats that I don't have to use leveling health to apply to my other stats that I care about. So I give that a two. Um, nine lives. Uh, this is what I consider the weakest perk in the entire game. I see no reason to ever take this perk on pretty much anybody. And the reason why is what nine lives does is when you would die in a fight, uh, you instead don't die and survive at one HP. Um, it doesn't do anything before that. It gives you no defensive perks walking into that. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't slow down the rate at which you approach dying. All it does is prevent that death one time. And it does nothing to protect you after that death. So if an enemy has a spear and stabs you twice and the first hit would kill you in nine lives procs and he stabs you again with the spear and you die, you're still dead. Uh, in other words, this doesn't do very much. I really, really don't like it. I, uh, I've... I've heard the argument that there might be a time to take it when uh, you need it on a character who you don't want to replace because he's super valuable and you don't want to level another one of those. Well, that's pretty much everybody, except that it, it isn't for free. The problem with nine lives is opportunity cost. If I take nine lives, I can't take another perk. And every other perk in the game is better than this perk. Um, I suppose if you had some super incredible set of um, traits that your character spawned with, like iron lungs and... Uh, I don't know, like the plus plus melee defense and iron lungs and something else. And, you know, he had low HP and it was early game. Maybe you'd take it. But even then, I would probably just I would probably just try to keep that character alive by putting him in safe positions and not not putting him in dangerous positions and not risking him on uh, dangerous fights, etc. I think this is probably the worst trait in the game. I would never take this on any of my characters. I can't think of a reason to do that. All right. Next up, bags and belts. I give this a three. Um it is a cool ability, but it is an expensive ability again because it is a perk point for two extra bag slots. What this does is uh, stuff in your bags costs half fatigue cost. So this, this shield normally costs me 10 fatigue to have equipped. When it's in my bag, it costs me five fatigue. Um, bags and belts removes the cost of having things in your, uh, in your inventory. Uh, to, uh, so this would now cost zero in here. Uh, to be in there and it gives you two more bag slots so you go to uh, four bag slots instead of two um, most of the time what I find is that four bag slots is a luxury and it's a luxury you don't need most of your guys are okay with two bag slots um, what you end up doing on some of the guys who would really like three or four three bag slots is you end up giving up your dagger which is unfortunate it makes it a little bit harder to farm certain points of armor but most of the time in the late game that's okay um, However, there are some builds that really take advantage of bags and belts where it becomes an absolutely incredible ability. These are, um, for me, what I call hybrid builds. As a, If you guys are interested in that, we'll, in a later date, I will release um, the, the build guide where I talk about the builds I've used. But these are for people who cycle through a lot of weapons. Um, my hybrids use crossbows, uh, pole arms, uh, and... Uh, great axes are what I use with them as well as a shield. So for them, it's really, really nice to have multiple options of things to switch out of their inventory that don't off, that don't cause me a huge amount of stamina because I have a use and a reason for each of those things in my inventory. So if you have a build that really requires a bunch of things in your inventory, this is a pretty strong perk for that. Uh, it gives you both stamina and utility. And I really like it. It's just that most of my guys can't afford to run it compared to something else. All right, Pathfinder. This one's gonna be a little bit controversial because I hear from some people that Pathfinder is the greatest skill in the game. I actually think it's one of the worst skills in the game. I give Pathfinder a five on the power rating. Um, I use it on basically one build and that build is not even a build that I consider essential. It's just kind of a novelty build. Um, what Pathfinder does is it reduces the cost of moving around on rough terrain. Uh, so rough terrain, um, costs you extra action points and extra stamina to move around on. And this reduces that. Here's the problem. Here's what I don't like about Pathfinder. And I want, I want to put this in perspective too, because I've now beaten the game as much as you can beat an open-ended game. I've explored and defeated all of the hardest content on the hardest difficulty levels, including the Black Monolith and the Goblin City. And my Black Monolith fight was in the swamp. In other words, it was in the most difficult terrain in the game, the highest movement and highest action point and highest fatigue cost uh, terrain in the game. Uh, and I didn't have Pathfinder on anybody and I still beat the stupid thing. So it, from that logic, it feels like it isn't necessary. From the rest of the logic going up into that, there are almost no fights when I wished I had Pathfinder, especially not on all of my characters. And occasionally on one or two characters, I'd be like, man, I wish I had Pathfinder here, but it was mostly kind of a throwaway gag kind of joke for the season. But here's why it's not that good. So 
Of the weapon types you have, the ranged weapons clearly don't really care that much about the terrain. Yes, you might want to go up some terrain, but mostly you can make it to where you want to shoot from within one turn. You might lose one shot with or without Pathfinder across the course of a fight to make it to some terrain with a ranged character. Um, Two-handers. It takes them, they have, it takes, for, for a two-hander to attack, it takes them six action points, which means that you can, uh, every character has nine action points, which means to move, you're going to move, you can either move for, uh, on, on the, the, how do I say this? With a two-handed weapon, with an attack cost of six, you only have three action points to spend relocating in between targets. Three action points is enough to relocate on forest, snow, and basic plain terrain because it costs you three it costs you three action points in snow three action points in forest and two action points in basic terrain to move around so you can keep you can already relocate on on um most of the terrain types you're going to fight and that includes moving up and down elevations although clearly not elevations plus uh plus rough terrain the only scenarios in which pathfinder will actually help a two-hander is in a swamp scenario where it costs four to move or when he's moving across elevation and on rough terrain, like elevated forest or elevated snow. For the one-handers, it's even worse. On a one-hander, you can't move and attack twice. But if you choose to move, uh, if you choose to only attack once in a turn, you have five action points to move. Which means with Pathfinder, you could move two tiles on, on rough terrain uh, or two tiles on, on easy terrain. Uh, without Pathfinder, you can move one tile uh, on rough terrain or uh, two tiles on open terrain. What I find is that most of the time, the way those numbers work out is on snow, on grass, on uh, forest, I have plenty of action points and still can relocate without difficulty. The only exception to this really basically for me is swamp and I tend to avoid swamp fights most of the time uh, unless I'm forced to. And when I'm forced to, I just suck up the penalty because again, the opportunity cost is too high. If I have Pathfinder, 90% 90, 90 of my fights, I don't gain any advantage of it. 90% of the scenarios, I don't gain any advantage from it. I might as well have a perk that helps me all of the time. So I don't know, like I've, I've now played a, a campaign on Iron Man. I've played campaigns in the highest difficulty. I've completed all the content. I haven't found the need to have Pathfinder. Yes, of course, it would be nice if it cost me nothing, if there was no opportunity cost, if I could have this and the other things I wanted, of course I would take it. The effect is nice, but the effect hasn't seemed necessary to do what I need to do to actually be, uh, to do well in the game. So for me, it's just a perk that's like, oh, that sounds nice, but I'm never gonna use it. Mobility in this game is, kind of a little bit overrated. Uh, formations are important. Your positioning relative to your opponents is important, but that's not so much of like a hit and run. There's not like a cal uh, like a like a horse unit that's going to be hitting and running and disengaging and re-engaging. And even if you did do that, the disengaging and re-engaging are different skills entirely than this. So there's not a lot of benefit to be able to move around uh, all the time. And Pathfinder is one of these abilities too that is kind of, you almost need it on everybody or nobody. Because if two of your guys have Pathfinder and able to reposition easily, well, that still leaves 10 of your guys who are stuck in whatever position they spawn in. And as soon as the enemy engages them is stuck, which means that, okay, you have two guys with Pathfinder, but they're probably staying with the pack anyways. So this would be more, this would be a skill that's better on somebody who has a reason to move around. I do have one build like that. We'll talk about him when I do the build, uh, the build, uh, the guide and there's an argument this could be okay on archers but archers are already so starved they already have so many things that they want to take that i have a very hard time fitting this into an archer build so i really don't like pathfinder but i think this is going to be a relatively controversial uh, uh pick from my from my from me compared to your opinions but we'll see you guys can leave me some feedback and let me know all right adrenaline um i give uh adrenaline a three and it's, it's a toss up between a three and a four for me because what I found is I can't use the friggin' skill. I love the skill, the skill is great, but I can't seem to use it. Um, so what Adrenaline does is it gives you an ability and it's it, it's a complicated skill. So let's talk about this. Well, it gives you an ability that you can use, um, it costs you no action points to use, but it does cost you 25 fatigue to use. And it puts you at the start of the turn order for the next turn which means that you are guaranteed to go first after using Adrenaline. Um, the nice part about Adrenaline is uh, if, if you're running this setup, so when I set up setups for people, uh, I've made some recommendations about this before, but I really recommend you don't use auto end turn. 
And what this means is you can take an attack with a guy who might, might have adrenaline and it uses up all of his action points. Let's say you had, uh, you had nine action points, you moved one terrain across snow and then you made an attack with a two-handed weapon that used all nine of your action points. You're now at zero action points. Okay, you can still postpone ending your turn at that point. And why you might do that is because you can use adrenaline, which is a zero skill point skill, and you can make the decision after the entire round has resolved itself. And you said, okay, I need to go first next round. And you can still then use adrenaline. If you auto end turn after you use all nine of your action points by moving and attacking, it will auto end your turn and you won't have the option to use adrenaline uh, after seeing how the next part of the fight uh, actually plays out. So I think adrenaline is very versatile in that, in that, uh, in that scenario because uh, it costs you nothing. That zero, no action points rather, it costs you a ton of stamina, we'll get to that in a second. The zero action point uh, cost of adrenaline is amazing. Um, my feel that the intent, my, my, my sense is the intent of the skill is you only get to use it once or twice a fight because the 25 fatigue cost is astronomically high. That is a really, really painful amount of fatigue. You only recover 15 fatigue in a fight, um, the guys I find adrenaline to be the most useful on are my hybrid characters, the basically back rank uh, DPS that use uh, pole arms or pikes or that type of thing. And they don't have a way to recover, for me anyways, don't have a way to recover stamina. I don't, I don't run recover on them, which means that every stamina cost I use above uh, 15 is permanently lost stamina. It comes out of their, their pool of stamina uh, that they're going to have in a fight. It's really nice to go first on demand a lot of times it doesn't matter and it's really expensive to use adrenaline to do that. That's kind of why it's right on the border of three and four to me, but I've put it on three. I found that I had the stamina to use this on a pure pike build, but I found pure pike builds to be worse than, uh, than my hybrid builds that use a pike plus a ranged weapon. And I found that I didn't have the skill points, the perk points available on a hybrid build to also fit in adrenaline and also fit in something that gave me some sort of stamina recovery. Um, I found that I, I basically stammed out all the time uh, using adrenaline. This skill is really cool. I would love to figure out a build that could use it because it's very interesting as a skill. It gives you a lot of tactical flexibility in terms of uh, being able to move, uh, you know, because the way you can work in this game is you can wait till you can wait till the end of a turn to move and then you can pop adrenaline and then uh, go at the beginning of the next round, which essentially is giving you two turns in a row, which is really good for mobility. It's really good for flanking like a necromancer or something. It's really good for getting burst damage in where they can't retaliate. There's some really cool things you can do with the adrenaline. However, I haven't found a build that can really take advantage of the stamina cost associated with it, as well as uh, uh, make it worthwhile to have this skill over some other skill. Again, opportunity cost comes into play with that. I like it, but it's hard to use. And I don't think it's all that powerful because of the insane stam cost on it. All right, recover. I don't personally like the skill very much, um, but I think it's fairly powerful. Um, I give this a one, I give this probably the most powerful uh, skill I can have. I go back and forth on who needs it. I have had builds where I've used this on archers. I've since not, I don't take this on archers anymore. I've had builds where I use this on um, my two-handers. I still have it in my two-handed build, but it's one of the things I'm considering dropping entirely, which is interesting. We'll talk about that, excuse me, in another guide video. Um, but what I have found, this is pretty damn good for your frontliners, um, especially frontliners who are using things like maces. And what you'll, what you'll find in the, especially in the mid and late game, once you have good characters and you start getting access to two-handed weapons and characters strong enough to use two-handed weapons is your guys with shields, your, your bread and butter, uh, you know, sword and board guys who are on the front line that you used all through the early parts of your games are less useful than they used to be. They can't keep up in damage and their survivability isn't all that much better than the, the other survivability of your guys without shields. They're not that much better survivability. And when you are bringing them, you need them to do something important. So what this, this is really where Recover comes in for me. This is really where Recover shines. Um, Recover is really good with some of the specialty weapons. It's incredibly good with maces. Maces have a very high uh, fatigue cost for using the stun portion of maces. Recover synergizes very, very nicely with that. Recover synergizes very nice with things like taunt, which um, you can throw out a number of taunts in a round to protect people, uh, and then you're gonna stam out, but Recover will let you do that. Recover synergizes very nicely with flails. Flails in the early game in particular are a very good way to farm gear, uh, to do damage to humanoid opponents in ways that you can't. Recover synergizes very well with Lash because Lash has high uh, fatigue cost. 
In other words, I really like this on my frontliners. And at the moment I'm running this on two handers, although I feel like it may be one of their weaker skills. Um, the thing that, the way that recover works is it gives you back, um, so it, it takes the stand, so let's take this guy for example. He's got 78 fatigue. Um, let's say I was at uh, all 78 fatigue. When I click recover, so I, I, was, at, I was at 78 of 78 fatigue. Um, when I do that, when I click recover, it will take all nine of my action points and it will give me back immediately half of that, of half of my total fatigue that I've used. So if I had used 78, I'd get 39 fatigue back. If I'd only used 40 fatigue, recover would only give me 20 fatigue back. In other words, recover is better the larger the amount of stamina you have uh, that you've used and also the larger amount of stamina that you have total because you want to wait until you've used that because the cost of recover is nine action points which is basically a round. Now what recover synergizes amazingly with is one-handed weapons um, in particular one-handed weapons in berserk so this synergizes really nicely on duelists. Um, my last playthrough that I've just done um, I found that duelists with recover are amazing because you can then kill something with your first action which costs you four action points berserk will give you your four action points back and then you have nine action points that you can use to recover and that's a pretty damn cool uh, combo so i found that recover is really good on the the sword and board guys who have specialty weapons it's really good on duelists it's not as good on two-handers we'll talk about that more in a different video and i didn't find it useful on my range characters or hybrid characters or back rank characters pretty much at all but it's still really damn powerful in the scenarios that you're going to want to use it. So I'm giving that a one. Um, again, but it's a super high cost. It costs you a turn to use that unless you have Berserk. All right, let's take a look at Student. Student. Uh, I give this a one. I give this a, one of the most powerful perks in the game. I don't actually recommend this on everybody in the early game, although I do recommend this on everybody on the late game. Um, student is a little uh, deceptive in how it's worded. Um, so what Student does is it costs you a perk point. Uh, your character who you take this on will get a 20% experience boost from then on out until uh, until he hits level 11. At level 11, he'll lose that experience boost again. And when you hit to level when you hit level 11, instead of getting one perk point, you'll get two perk points. Which means when you finish the build, when the character hits the soft level cap, you're going to get the perk point you spent on student back. When you look at that initially, you're like, man, I should take that on everybody. Uh, you know, especially if you think about the 20%. The 20% means that. In the time it would take you to get um, five levels on a regular guy, you actually would get six levels on uh, on uh, your your dude here, right? So you would you would think that you would recoup this before level eleven. The thing is, the the cost of leveling up in each level goes up at a rate that negates that. So a guy who has student is always going to be down a perk point, always until level eleven, because. Even when the guy with student um, is level 10, the, actually, how do I say this? The, the guy without student is always going to be uh, ahead by one perk until level 11. Because despite the fact the guy who is leveling 20% faster, 20% faster will not hit level 10 faster than the guy who just already had that. I don't think I've explained that very well. Um, I almost need to show you guys some math for that. Basically, the increase in experience in between levels outweighs this 20%. So what student is giving you is it's giving you faster access to stats slightly, but slower access to perks and an overall reduction in the amount of time it takes to level the character from 1 to 11. Now, that, that, isn't, to be, that isn't to be scoffed at. That's a really big advantage, but it doesn't make every character who takes student better than every character who doesn't after like level 7, for example. It doesn't do that. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is the people who take student are going to be one perk behind versus the guys who don't take perk uh, student until level 11 when they catch up again. So I do like it. I like it on my range characters, who uh, my backline characters in general who are a little bit safer, who can be afford to be a little bit slower on their perks. And I like it on characters in the mid and late game who I'm leveling when I already have a group of guys to protect them. So if I already have a fairly decent company, then when I recruit a new guy, of course I'll throw a student on him because that means I can level him faster to get him to his role and I'll level him from a safer position. But what I don't like student on is I don't like student on my front line. Uh, especially in the early game uh, because my front line is going to be high risk uh, and they need their perks for survivability and someone who takes student is going to have less survivability at, at, at the same amount of experience as anybody else uh, because they have one less perk point to defend themselves with. 
Um, we can do the math at some other point. I don't think it's really in the scope of this video. Uh, somewhere on one of my build sheets, I have the student math to look at that, but it is a little deceptive of how it initially reads. So I, I strongly recommend this. Uh, another thing that student does really nicely is if you have a guy who you're not really sure what you want to do with him, so you look at him and you look at his stats and you say, man, these stats are pretty good. He's got stars in the right positions, but there's a couple of st stats that he doesn't have stars on that I really need to make some decisions about later. Like, uh, I'm not sure if I want to make him into a duelist or a two-hander. What's his stamina going to be like? Well, his stamina is not starred, which means it's going to be a lot of RNG based on uh, you know, based on the role of how good I got on a stamina role uh, to be how far I can get with that character. So I don't want to make the decision on what he's going to be right now. I want to wait. I don't want to assign perk points right now because I can't get those perk points back. So I want to wait to level him in the back lines with just like a pike and see where his stamina ends up at level 10. Students are a really good, good way to do that because you just throw a point in student, level him faster. You don't assign the perk points at all across the course of the game until you get him to like level 10 or 11 until you can see enough of his stats that, that the dice has already been cast so you can make a prediction then then you can decide what you want to do with him. So I, you'll see in a lot of my playthroughs, I won't assign all the perk point on characters. Sometimes I won't assign any perk points past the first perk point in student because I don't yet know if he's going to have enough stat growth that I need to take Colossus or if he's going to have enough stat growth that I need to take Gifted or if he's going to have enough stat growth that I don't have to take either of them and I just want to level the character to a point where I can make that decision and student's really, really good for that. I really like this ability but I, I want to be clear, I don't actually endorse taking this on every single character like I've seen some players do. Okay, I know this is running on a little bit. As I said, uh, I really enjoy talking about the perks. I think they're very, very interesting in this game. Um, so uh, we're going to do this across the course of a couple videos. I think the next ones will go a little bit faster, but I am going to cut the video here uh, and we'll move on to the next perks in the next video. Uh, so I guess this ended up being just the tier two perks, the, the level two perks. So um, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, oh, actually, you know what? I thought about one more thing I want to say about student before we go, which is... Um, Another thing, thing that student does nicely is a lot of uh, some builds you will have um, won't need a perk point at level one or level two. So you might want to put uh, a number of perk points in the later builds and you might not want any perk points in level one or level two. If you're ever in a scenario where you look at that and you go, there are no level one perks I want on this character at all. For example, if you have an archer and you don't want fast adaptation on that archer and you don't want recover on that archer, you might look at this and say, none of these skills are any good. In that scenario, student is, a, is just an immediate must pick because then you can get a, get a way to get past the, the, the level two perks and onto the level three perks without having to invest in one of the level two perks. So in some level, in some, in some builds, student lets you skip a weak perk that you wouldn't normally want in a build uh, to get an extra perk, which is just an incredible bonus on top of its 20% leveling bonus. Anyways, guys, as I said, I'm gonna cut the video here. Um, Hopefully the, the conversation has been interesting about the various perks here. And as I said, I will in a future video um, show you some of the builds that I have built and that will maybe help uh, put the perks as we talked about them into builds and you can get a sense of how a character performs in a different way, but those will be different videos. So thanks for watching guys. Uh, stay tuned in the very near future for uh, the rest of the perk breakdown. Thanks for watching.